Good morning, I'm Trevor Burbridge. I should be chairing this afternoon's session on anomaly detection, so please join us then for more wide and more varied conversations. Uh, but this morning I will be introducing Professor Idris Eckley. I work in applied research and we've had uh, a large number of years now of collaboration with uh, Idris's group. Idris works uh, in a doctoral school in statistics and operational research called Story at Lancaster, specialising really in anomaly and change detection. And every anomaly and change detection problem is slightly different. And that's where the power of our relationship really works because Idris obviously has a large number of students who are eager to work on developing new methods. We have a large number of business problems within BT and a large number of data sets. Uh, and together we can work on developing really quite a large tool set that can be applied to different anomaly detection problems. Uh, so let me hand over to, to Idris. Thanks, Trevor, for that introduction. And um, good morning, everybody. Uh, just to reassure you, uh, it's still early, so I'm not intending to inflict too many equations, or hopefully any equations as part of this talk. Um, hopefully going to set out a little bit of our, our approach and philosophy with the work that we've been doing um, uh, over the last few years as part of uh, this prosperity partnership. OK, so in the beginning, so this is the really scary bit, what we said we'd do with the proposal, um, and uh, I thought I'd put it here because we've, ac we've, we've actually kind of been true to what we said several years ago. One of our original objectives within the proposal was to create a new autonomic framework, as Nick described earlier, for digital infrastructure to equip the nodes of the infrastructure network with the ability to understand their state, detect and diagnose disruptions uh, to service and take autonomous actions. And it's that detect and diagnose disruptions that we've really been focusing on uh, within the kind of anomaly and, and recommendation stream of, uh, of work that's been going on. Um, if we think about dis detecting disruptions, the, one of the reasons we picked up on this is that as, a, as an area within the Prosperity Partnership is it builds on a track record of BT's collaboration supporting the development of change point analysis in recent years, and that stretches across uh, many different people from in BT, from Kel Jensen to Trevor and Dave Yearling. Um, and much of that work that's been ongoing has been on developing novel detection, the diagnostic methods required to establishing automated analysis and anomaly identification to routinely inform decision making and drive automation. So our aim within, within the Prosperity Partnership is to provide the mechanisms to transfer the raw data into effective actions by creating efficient change point analysis and anomaly detection methods uh, that can detect potential changes in operational performance, for example. OK, so this is a, this is as technical as we're going to get. So change points 101, what do we mean by a change point to start with? So let's say we're observing data Y1 up to Yn. Um, then a change point is said to, uh, to exist at a specific time point t. If, if the structure of Y1 to Yt is different from Yt plus 1 to n in some way. And there are many, many different way, ways of, of, of uh, framing this change problem. So you could have a change in the mean level where you're looking to identify you know, these various change points as we go from uh, from zero to 500 across the, the, the left hand image here. Um, you can have changes in volatility, you can have changes in slope, you can have permutations of all of these things. Um, and whilst it's very easy to describe what a change point is, actually finding the blighters is, 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 is quite tricky. Um, and to do that computationally quickly but accurately is 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 notoriously hard what are anomalies then so anomalies are more subtle uh, in, in many ways uh, than than change points so um, it could be one or a sequence of observations that's not conforming to the general pattern so we can think of an anomaly as being a temporary behavior in some way and there are numerous types of anomalies and just to kind of talk about two here um, a point anomaly uh, be it either global or contextual, is a single observation that, that's an out outlier with regards to the data set. Um, and so in the bottom left hand uh, uh, plot here, I've got a, a very obvious example of a point anomaly. So we, you know, th these are very easy uh, things to be able to see uh, most of the t some of the time. Collective anomalies, there's, these are sequences of observations that are not uh, anomalous when considered individually together. So if you're in the data here, you think, well, is there an anomaly here? But when you start to look at uh, the data as a whole, then you start to see that they form an anomalous pattern. Um, 
and then we can have a mixture of point and collective anomalies and that's just one 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 way of uh, viewing anomalies within data so why use change points and anomalies to dis detect these disruptions well the intuition here is that a sudden change in the operational performance will tend to manifest itself as a change within the observed data stream it's very very kind of simplistic way of viewing the world but you know if, if we're if we've got a good good set of uh, measures that we're observing about our, pro our processes uh, then we should be able to see you know, directly within the data that we're observing any changes or aberrations that are occurring within that the, the, within the, the process itself we may not know in advance what types of changes are normally to expect or which interventions to make in response to it and that's all part of the sort of learning journey that we're trying to do with this work now historically the statistics community at large and and uh, various statisticians with BT have been looking at change point methods, particularly from a kind of computational uh, uh, statistics perspective to try and find fast and accurate methods for detecting changes. But historically, anomalies have been um, an area of statistics, at least, that have been, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe historically when I was being taught statistics as, you know, as an undergrad in the last century, um, anomalies were a pain you know they were the sort of thing that we had to deal with so yeah, we'd like to identify them as outliers to understand what influence they'd have on the models and if we could get rid of them then that was nice because it made everything easier but obviously it's increasingly clear that anomalies are interesting and relevant in their own right and are very important because they are, they are very very much a, a signal of something going on so fleeting though they may be identifying anomalous structure quickly accurately and with confidence is important if we want to find the onset of events or rapid detection of a fault or some sort of change in in in, in an actor's behavior or something like that so the questions we might ask and just these are just sort of generic questions if we focus on anomaly detection are has an anomaly occurred if yes where is the anomaly what are the properties of that anomalous data what is the probability that an anomaly has occurred? Uh, how certain are we of uh, the location of the anomaly? How many anomalies have occurred? Um, can we search for those sequentially? Um, and are the anomalies identified of practical relevance? Just because it's statistically significant doesn't mean that it's it's um, of operational significance. So, um, so the sort of challenges we've been tasked with are uh, 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 illustrated by the following sort of suggestions or comments we've had from working with folks in BT. So remembering that the nature of an anomaly is context dependent and the context also dictates potentially the differences in the use case that motivates how that anomaly detection will be used. It's important that we work closely with those that own the problems, understand the data, understand where the glitches happen um, to make sure that the, the, the kind of statistical questions we pose of the data are meaningful uh, and and uh, for for the way in which they might be used so for example trevor uh, early on would say something like well in real time i would like to learn about the normal operation of the network and automatically alert anomalous behavior that may be an indication of failure degrading performance or misconfiguration so that suggests a, you know, a process which is normally in a steady state and we'd like to be able to identify deviations from that um, whereas working with Peter Willis uh, with a different uh, problem set, he was saying, well, can you detect the onset of when a day is starting to be behave differently? And we're going to use these two examples to, to kind of uh, um, of, of um, kind of um, problem instantiations to talk, uh, to frame some of the anomaly detection work that we've done. Um, before we get to that, I thought I'd talk a little bit about why we're adopting a statistical approach to anomaly detection here. And Trevor touched a little bit on this. Um, I think there are many benefits here. I mean, you, know, you, you can find turnkey solutions. There are various heuristic ways that one could define how you'd cut, you know, choose a cut point or a threshold over which uh, an anomaly may occur. But actually, what statistics provides is a rigorous framework for us to start to to form the kind of generic change uh, anomaly detection problems in a way that can be 
repeated and generalized in different ways. So what we seek to do is describe the data we observe based on assumptions and some form of model. And by adopting a model based approach that enables us to incorporate the context and make explicit the assumptions about the data generating process or what we do or maybe don't know about the data generating process that underpins the analysis. Uh, in framing the, the way we look at the problem in this way, we're also able to establish rigorous theory about the anomalies detected. Uh, you know, so this is you know, where we kind of can rely on math the rigor of mathematical proof here. And this can help shed important light on issues, for example, on what scale of anomaly we can and can't detect. So how different does it need to be before we would detect it? How quickly do our estimates of where those anomalies are converge to the truth? Because we're dealing with estimates all the time and you know, they will be slightly wrong. Um, but, but how quickly can they converge to the truth if we've got more and more data? Um, if we were dealing with things in an online setting, well, what is the expected delay between the anomaly's occurrence and when it would be detected you know, and it'd be triggered um, in an online setting? And that, so that theory is really helpful in understanding what we can and can't say about the anomalies around us. Um, and I guess the other benefit of this approach is the methods we develop are pertinent to a class of scenarios. So the methods are typically readily adaptable to other similar settings, but perhaps with slightly different assumption sets, and that might mean slightly different parameter settings or slight, slight tweaks to the approach. Um, and our experience, um, and I'm hopeful, hopeful that Trevor would agree with this, is that this approach yields superior results and understanding compared to, for example, a purely heuristic or a kind of turnkey solution. OK, so um, our, our, our kind of philosophy uh, within this part of the work is that, that, that many of the canonical examples within a future autonomic system can be sitting today uh, in the data centric infrastructure that we've already got. And that's why we've been working closely with folks who uh, have uh, anomaly problems now, because we think that they're going to be uh, you know, good examples of what we will see in the future in different guises. Um, we feel that the best methodological research is inspired by and feeds, feeds back into the real world challenge and that very much aligns with the philosophy that Tim outlined earlier from BT's perspective about you know, working in partnership. So for us, as well as BT, coll close collaboration has been key to success. Um, also as part of our philosophy, we believe that the methods should be generic and, and reproducible by others to so the code that we develop. Um, uh, as proof of concept code is 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 readily available and normally docu well documented so that others can pick it up. Um, but as we're moving forward, so we'll, you know, we'll get to some of the anomaly detection problems in a minute. One of the real challenges for us, and I think the bit that we're going to be working on more and more in the next year or so, is this issue of statistical versus operationally interesting anomalies. Um, and now understanding, you know, we're now undertaking work to develop learning and recommendation to sit above this sort of anomaly detection layer with a view to enabling autonomous learning in the longer term. And we'll come back to that a little bit later in the slides. OK, so what have our design principles been? And I was just kind of thinking, you know, in a kind of abstract way of what, what is it that we do in general on the methods that we develop? Well, we're seeking to develop methods that are fast, transparent, accurate, um, and take computational realities into account. So by fast, I mean the methods that are scalable so that they could be used on either really large data sets or in an online setting. That the methods are transparent in, in so much as if it highlights an anomaly, it should be clear why that result has been identified. Um, accurate um, and low false detection rates, I guess we're all, all too aware of this with the, uh, COVID sadly about false positives and the like. Um, we want we want our anomaly detection methods to detect the anomalies that are really there, but we don't want them to alert um, anomalies that aren't there. And what we, when we, we're doing this in a very much a statistical context, so in terms of statistically there is an anomaly there, but that doesn't mean that it might not you know, be operationally relevant or irrelevant. And finally, um, taking computational considerations into account, and increasingly this is a feature of our work too. So, uh, Right, you know, so far we've been dealing with kind of 
centralized problems which have lots of computing resource but increasingly we're finding examples and hearing about examples where the computational resource is l is less and so having a kind of lower cost footprint computationally is important and so we're trying to take that into account as, as part of our design principles for de developing these anomaly detection methods okay and of course doing all of this within in a, a, a rigorous theoretical framework okay so within ngcdi there's been three real um areas of activity um that would would you'll we'll see today one is uh, around the kappa suite so this is around detecting um point and collective anomalies in a variety of settings so we started off with the single series then we moved to multiple series which were independent of each other then to correlated series and then an online setting and i'll talk you through that uh, in a little bit more detail in a minute uh, then uh, there's been the um, FAST suite, um, detecting emergence of a new anomaly within functional settings. So, so the Kappa suite's kind of emerging out of the challenge that Trevor set, the FAST suite's emerging out of a challenge that Pete, uh, Peter Willis set. And then NUNC is some work uh, that um, Ed Austin will d demonstrate later this afternoon, uh, working with Dave Yearling and others on a computationally efficient, non-parametric approach to detecting um, uh, changes. Um, okay, and ho hopefully if it's time this afternoon, Keswell might be able to talk a little bit about the work he's doing now on uh, anomaly detection for lower compute environments, which is very much kind of blue sky uh, problem at the moment that we're looking at. Okay, so Kappa, uh, the Kappa suite, so the original algorithm, the, the aim within Kappa was, is to detect um, global, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, oh, these sort of uh, point anomalies, which are single observations, so these red dots uh, that are outliers with regard to the data set uh, and their local context, respectively, whilst also being able to discover these uh, regions of collective anomaly, which may be changes in mean or changes in variance um, uh, that are not anomalous when considered individually, but if you look at it as a region, it's clearly anomalous to the uh, the uh, kind of the baseline signal that we have in in our steady state. And so this is the first real piece of anomaly detection work that we did with um, uh, Alex Fish um, uh, a few years ago, um, and that's really led to a whole uh, suite of. So this is a, a computationally efficient method, so it can be run in, or, in order n, so it's in linear time. Um, and and works really really effectively um but naturally gives rise to questions of well what happens if we want to set, extend this to a multivariate setting so let's say we're we're looking at four streams at once or it could be 40 streams at once um well you can get point and collective anomalies just as easily in that setting but in this setting also we'd want to allow for the fact that actually the collective anomalies may not occur at all series at once they may instead occur in subsets of series, and that makes the problem uh, more complicated. Um, we might also, as you can see in this right-hand example, have some sort of jitter on as to when um, the collective anomaly starts. So we may have, you know, this is the broadband of when the collective anomaly starts, but for, for some reason there may be a, start, a delay um, or an early finish uh, in a particular channel. And so how could we connect develop a method that would allow us to identify these as being common um, and being a subset together um, and still allow us to identify point anomalies as well. And so that work, um, that problem kind of begat multivariate kappa. Um, here we're assuming that there's no dependence between these streams other than when those uh, anomalies are occurring in parallel. From there, of course, it's natural to think about, well, what happens if we do have, uh, we can incorporate um, uh, cor correlation between the different series here. And so this is where uh, a, um, a third kind of uh, generation of the tool arose, arose with a, a correlated um, uh, kappa. Um, now here I've got some data from a, a, a uh, a, a different sort of in industrial setting um, and um, what we have are 
uh, sorry, this is a simulated setting, not the industrial setting. And here what we have are regions where we know that there are um, collective anomalies um, and, and point anomalies, and those are highlighted blue, so true is blue. And in uh, the left-hand plot, we have the Kappa CC estimate, so the one that allows for correlation. And in the right-hand plot, we have the Kappa MV, so we're assuming the series are independent of each other. And if we assume the series are independent of each other, we find the anomaly that is very, very much shared across the series. But the these two collective anomalies on the to, to the left and the right um, are missed. Um, it's only by allowing the model to understand that they could be correlation that we start to find that and that the evidence for that is actually only residing in one or a couple of different series. Um, again, this is a method that's quite quite efficient in time, not quite linear time, but not, not, not far from it. OK, and then um, we also use this approach with um, um, some collaborators uh, in Norway um, who, who were visiting with some um, uh, operational data from um, uh, subsea exploration. And here there were areas of where known anomalies were you know, known to exist. And when we overlay what, what Kappa CC found, we found that they were coinciding, you know, our estimates were coinciding with the regions identified by the expert. But interestingly, and this seems to happen quite often, we also identify this region here, which hadn't been identified by the uh, subsea experts. And when we went back to them and had a chat about it, they said, oh, oh yes, we missed that one. Yes, that could well be an anomaly. And I think that's often the case with anomalous structure. Um, even those that work with data on a regular basis um, can miss anomalies because they are very subtle, they are fleeting. And so sometimes um, methods may find uh, anomalies that we may not have previously known were there. So a bit of care is required in, in the interpretation. And I think, yet again, evidence of why having human in the loop in, in any of these analysis is important to sort of validate what it is that we're finding. Um, OK, and now here's an example of the final stage of the kind of Kappa evolution, which was to make Kappa go online, so a sequential Kappa algorithm. And this was work with uh, Lawrence Bardwell, who'd been employed in the grant um, uh, at the start, working with, with Trevor and an example that Trevor's kindly provided, looking at um, some uh, data that, that he, he, you've been analysing, right, Trevor? Um, and as time goes on, we're collecting more and more of this data, the green lines representing some sort of trend that we're removing from the data as it's going along. And as time goes on, we should eventually hit the red of an issue. And you could see how quickly it was after the data had been observed that, uh, or the anomaly had been observed, that we were we were finding that um, that collective anomaly. Okay. The fast suite, well, that's, that's coming from a challenge that Peter Willis set of, can you detect when a day is starting to behave differently? Um, and yeah, here we've got some throughput data and for if you overlay different days, you can see that the throughput data on the left looks really you know, nice and well behaved. Um, here we've created you know, some deliberate um, anomalies to this, to the, the kind of bulk of the data um, where, where we have obvious anomalies occurring at the other at the beginning of the day or for the green line or midway through the day for the red or for the um, turquoise line at the, at the end of the day. But most of the time, the data follows this nice functional form. And so FAST uses that insight into what the structure of the data is to look for deviations in the functional form. Now, Peter, of course, we, we, we very early on when we got this data, went, of course, there's off the peg tools that we can use from other statisticians that are already looking and detecting these that can tell you, yes, this day is different. It's obvious. But then Peter, very, very rightly said, but by the end of the day, we all know it's happened. You know, the problems, the, you know, the fires happened, the house has burnt down, it's too late by then. Can you detect it as it's emerging? And that's where the idea for FAST uh, happens. So I'm hoping that this animated GIF is coming across. OK, so there's a green line followed by a black line being traced out on this plot. And at some point, it, it, it crosses over and becomes an anomaly and turns red. 
and then we get some other observations again these become anomalous relative to the day and you can see just how quickly let me just start that up again just how quickly with this fast algorithm that um ed austin will be talking a bit more about it this afternoon um just how fast uh, fast is able to detect uh you know the onset of the anomaly um, as it's emerging uh, in a day so again a method that we believe can have quite some utility so some concluding remarks um i've just given you a brief taste of some of the change in anomaly detection work that we've been doing focusing in particular on the anomaly detection um and in particular focusing a little bit more on the sort of the generic problems um that, that we've been focusing on um because this afternoon is where you'll get the real taste of of, of the demos and the reality of of how that's been used um, or been trialed within BT. Our approach is one based on methodological development inspired by and feeding back into, into challenge you know, from, from you as an organization. So this close collaboration has been and continues to be a key to un unpicking the insight from the data here. Um, our belief is that many generic anomaly problems of the future can be seen in today's data. And so you're unpicking that and using that as a, a way of identifying the generic problems is really important. Um, and I think all of us involved think that the work to date is just the start. There's many, many more problem types out there and much more work needed. Um, and as I said earlier, you're know, looking to this coming year. One of the key things for us is this aspect of statistical versus operational interest or significance. Um, and this aspect of a real kind of learning and recommendation layer above it. And I guess one of the challenges that we found, and hopefully you know, there'll be a, just some discussion of this this afternoon, is the availability of labeled anomaly data. And I quite understand why, you know, anomalies are a pain. And once you've tracked them down and resolved them and moved on to fight, fight the next fire, you know, actually labeling an anomaly was there, what it was, and being able to uh, you kind of record it in, in in a systematic way. You know, these events is is time consuming and challenging. But actually, that data would be really valuable in allowing us to understand what was relevant, what wasn't relevant, what happened, how it was used, and that we could start to build that into our inference, so that not just it being about you know what is statistically significant, but we can start to build in this sort of relevance and recommendation layer above this. So hopefully there could be a bit of discussion about that this afternoon. Um, and just as a little um, advert for this afternoon session, so um, there will be demos on three different aspects um, this afternoon. So Trevor will be talking about work uh, with uh, SCAPA and CAPA on IP router monitoring. Um, Adam Broadbent and Ed Austin have been de developing some really nice work on uh, using FAST for uh, VCDN monitoring. And Ed Austin uh, um, last year did some work with Dave Yearling on NUNC for access line monitoring. So those three demos will be um, being discussed this afternoon, um, along with a whole host of, of, of other points, I'm, I'm sure. Just to say that these demos are quite nice in that they range from um, a, a complete proof of concept that is currently in the process of being um, kind of professionally coded up in the, in the work with NUNC through to uh, an implementation on a BT research test deck, you know, so a kind of internal demo in the case of VCDN and in the case of the IP router monitoring work that's that's already deployed now. So you get a sense of the different sorts of stages of the chain within the, the development of the anomaly detection research there. Um, as Steve said, so these are just use cases. And so what we're really interested in learning this afternoon is where else could these tools and methods be used or what other examples of anomalies are you seeing? 